thank you all of you for joining us in this conversation. May I request you to come up? We, we like to have more people, and that gives us some confidence that we are doing fine. Uh, uh, we are indeed uh, grateful to have you uh, uh, in this opportune time in, uh, in India. Uh, we are having a very passionate, emotional, and sometimes uh, troubling conversation about what it means to be an Indian, what it means to be a soldier, what it means to uh, represent, think, speak for our country, which we, I suspect most of us would want to say we love, uh, however you conceptualize the idea of pat patriotism. Um, and how do we, uh, more importantly, how do we think about the other? Uh, how do we imagine? How do we think? How do we speak more importantly? Because speaking has consequences. Um, and to what extent our notion of our love for our country should be coterminous with the government of the day? Uh, should a citizen retain the right to express dissent in times of a national crisis, uh, legitimate or uh, dubiously created for other purposes? Or should we keep quiet and rally behind the government irrespective? And when we speak, more importantly, not that whether the binary between speaking and not speaking, but when we do speak, how should we express ourselves is more important. That's where education comes in. It is not to suggest that uh, one or the other party in a conflict is right or wrong. That, of course, hard to find out for any citizen. But the question is that do we sufficiently complicate the picture so that we could meaningfully speak for in defense of something that which we hold dear and speak against something that we find disgusting? Now, the idea of disgust could run across the boundaries in the sense that there isn't a sense that one gets in this kind of conflicts, but there is a unitary actor, either say in this case India, is one single monolith that we call a nation state, that it expresses itself on behalf of so many citizens, that it can coherently speak for all of us. And similarly, on the other side, there isn't one single agency or institution or a state that could claim to represent all voices, right? So it is in that context that it is in that sense that patriot educating patriotism or educating for patriotism becomes relevant. After all, educational institutions are in the business of creating language, generating creative expressions, so that we could more or less meaningfully uh, be good or bad citizens, good or bad human beings, and uh, express ourselves and disclose ourselves to the world in times of crisis and conflict. So it isn't that I just wanted to lay out the context in which uh, we have invited uh, Ms. Abraham to come and uh, speak for us. Uh, a few words on uh, what I see the today's storyteller's context to me. To me, she has a biography and we have shared that with you. But I just wanted to uh, frame our speaker today in a certain sense. Um, of course, she is an uh, individual with the views of her own, a poet who has written poetry, and uh, recently she has given certain journalistic expressions to her thoughts. Uh, and also, she, on her own uh, admission, is a veteran's wife, and a veteran wife, both, I suspect. That's what we meant here. Uh, which is, uh, which is uh, in today's context, maybe somewhat... Uh, made problematic. Oh, the claim of a wife is uh, now both a word of nonsense and a troublesome person uh, in the Me Too and all of these discourses that we have. But I think what we are, we are, we, we, what perhaps that she would speak more of that is want to suggest that she has particular experiences 
that give meaning to our voice. And that's where being a veteran wife comes into context. Uh, it could also come in the context of having experienced uh, uh, certain events in one's life. For example, I was in Srinagar uh, managing operations in Kargil War. I saw a young man wishing me, uh, he was a flight lieutenant, I was a squad leader, which is one rank above, and in the military they uh, pay attention to these things and they take them very seriously. And he was my neighbor and he was uh, going to uh, an helicopter flight to combat zone that afternoon at 11 o'clock. And at 4, four o'clock, I was asked to go and receive his body. The helicopter crashed. And I've seen many such events and I went to recover, I don't want to talk much about that, but I went to recover a mangled body at a gun site in Kargil, uh, which was because, as you know, the guns were overused, the Bofors guns were overused. And some of them used to burst as you fire, killing people were the gunners. And these two happened, and one, one such uh, howl that I went, uh, I was asked to go in an helicopter and recover his mangled body and bring back. So such events have their own uh, uh, telling to us. They hold a uh, different kind of a meaning. Uh, and that's what perhaps Ms. Abrams meant being a veteran's wife and a veteran wife, that, which brings a wife in the sense a mother brings a certain kind of an attitude and compassion to the world. And that's what you, <coughs> that's why we are very keen to hear us here today. I'm sorry I've taken far too much time than I needed to. And the uh, floor is open. On February 14th, 2019, a convoy of 2,500 paramilitary soldiers was attacked in Pulwama, Kashmir by Adil Ahmed Dar a 20-year-old Kashmiri suicide bomber who belonged to the Pakistan-based Jaish-e Mohammed, J-E-M, a Diyabandi jihadist terrorist group active in Kashmir. The group's primary motive is to separate Kashmir from India and merge it into Pakistan. The attack killed at least 40 Central Reserve Police Force CRPF Jawans. It was a very heinous crime committed against India. On February 26th, India conducted a surgical strike at Balakot in Pakistan, targeting a terror training camp of the JEM. Sources claim 300 terrorists were killed and no civilian was hurt. On February 27th, a day after India's airstrike, an Indian Air Force pilot, Wing Commander Abhinandan Vartaman, dropped on the other side of the line of control when he ejected after being shot down in a dogfight with a Pakistani F-16. India, in a nationalistic frenzy, screamed war on television, Facebook, and Twitter. Everyone had an opinion, including journalists, on what India's moves should be. Among those many opinions was mine. An opinion that was expressed in an article I wrote for Scroll.in a year and a half ago. The article was written at a time when my husband, Colonel Bala, had taken premature retirement from the army. I had declared myself a pacifist army wife. It was republished during this time, and the forgotten article went viral suddenly. I was sought out by the media to give my opinion on war, as I was opposed to it, but married to an army man, now a veteran. Could I, in this angry and hostile environment, publicly stand up and request for no war? I did, and I'm glad for it. It is for this reason I sit before you, a distinguished audience, to give you a lecture on education for patriotism. I am glad to have been given this platform in your esteemed university, and thank Group Captain Krishnapa for facilitating this. Good afternoon, everybody. Being an army wife, you have an insider's view of how the military functions and what are human costs of maintaining the security of this country. You are confronted with the challenges the nation faces. It is your spouse's line of work to maintain the democracy and sovereignty of this country. 
He will be fighting terrorism in Kashmir, insurgencies in the Northeast, saving Arunachal from being bitten off by China. Not to forget, he is also helping rescue trapped coal miners in Meghalaya and evacuating flood victims in Kerala. As a military spouse, you are called upon to show solidarity. Sorry, I have pictures to go with it. So this was for the Pulwama, this is Abhinandan. And yeah, so as a military spouse, that's me with my unit lady, 602 Dinjan Sam. As a military spouse, you are called upon to show solidarity with the women of the unit. We are automatic members of AWA, the Army Wives Welfare Organization. Our job is to maintain the unit as one would a family, to stand united, to share concerns and problems, and also to look out for each other's safety and best interests. If there is a family quarrel, you counsel. A sickness, you tend. A neighborly dispute, you settle. A concern with the job, you take it to your spouse who will then, within procedure, take appropriate action. As someone rightly said, we army wives are the silent ranks. Let me tell you, as a military wife, a bit of my fantastical experience, which has been very beautiful and revealing too. I can never forget how magnificent I felt flying over the Himalayas in an AN-32, driving into the tea estates of the Brugger in Assam. That's the Brugger. And having a, enjoying a lovely Kashmiri meal with a soldier's wife, with a so, soldier's family and smelling peonies in his garden. Rambling through Gere points in Nasik and dressing in my finest at formal dinners. I remember with fondness the time when I went on to a post and sat with the soldiers of the Madras sappers whose faces had turned black from the sunburn and who lived in tents in minus degrees. They were so happy that someone came to visit and I was treated like a celebrity, not to, for, not to forget also the lifelong friends I have made in the army. This experience, though beautiful, was also very revealing. It showed me how little I knew of my country, the history of the Northeast, the numerous tribal factions at war. Why was Punjab a state with a high drug menace and a porous border? Is Arunachal Pradesh important to China? Standing at the Shankaracharya temple above the plain overlooking the city of Srinagar and hearing the Muazins call to pray, I wondered why we would want to fight over this true heaven on earth. Why was the Siachen Glacier, a terrain inhospitable to human life, so important to India that we have lost thousand soldiers to hostile weather since 1994? according to the Ministry of Defense. As an army wife, war is something you deal with regularly. Not full-blown wars, but human losses by way of terrorism, insurgencies, and other occupational hazards like suicide, fragging, and machinery malfunctions. My first risk with war came even before I married Puneet. Puneet and me had been communicating online and were supposed to meet in person. Unfortunately, the Kargil war was declared and army mobilization was quick. So we couldn't meet. I basically had no clue how he looked like. We had a brief goodbye telephone call. And after 10 months or so, I checked to see the list of 527 martyrs in the India Today magazine to see if his name figured. Three days later, he called. He was alive and well. Lucky, lucky me. A civilian like me, with no knowledge of war, had many innocent questions to ask. I remember him telling me about his first posting in Assam, where he lost his buddy. The bullet had just missed him. The buddy was on his way to see his newly born daughter. Puneet also lost his course mate, Captain Anuj Nayar, in the Kargil War. His parents live a few kilometers away from where we stay, but we have never met. Isn't it a shame? After being trolled for not wanting war, I actually called upon Captain Nayar's mother, a martyr's mother, to find out her view on war. She answered simply that she had to live and will continue to live the rest of her life with the loss of her son. The loss of her son, which was to her 
bigger than the country's victory. She bolstered my confidence when she said to me that one does not have to lose a husband or child to ask for peace. I think I might have been insensitive in asking a mother about war when she lost her son to it. Most partners of martyrs do not like discussing their loss and prefer to move on. Some hold on to memories like Dimple Chima, the girlfriend of Major Vikram Batra, who has remained unmarried and feels like her slain boyfriend is away on posting. I also met two officers, one young and one senior, both of whom served in Siachen and suffered from punctured lungs. Meeting them was a pivotal point in my life. I realized how we are risking and maiming lives for a mountain that no human being can, will ever live on. I was on a flight from Assam when I saw a coffin of a soldier wrapped in the tricolor being loaded. In the Srinagar airport, it is common to see coffins of martyrs, said my friends. I met the 1965 war veterans and also Rasul and Bibi, the widow of 1965 war hero Paramveer Chakra Havaldar Ab Abdul Hamid. She was old and feeble. She told me she was lonely and I should visit her sometime. I also met the father Arveer Singh. I read about him from the book 1965, Stories from the Second Indo-Pakistan War by Rachna Bisht. From Chingar Kalan village, Daswa, a proud 78 years old Sikh soldier with dark piercing eyes, a crisp upturned mustache and a flowing white beard said to me, he suffers the pain of a thousand needles pricking his skin every summer when the temperature rises. The father Arveer Singh was so badly burnt when a Cobra missile blew up his tank in the Battle of Philora that he lost his eyesight for many months. He recounts how he had climbed out of his burning tank with skin, hair and clothes burnt off his body, screaming in pain with his metal, melting metal kada clinging to his wrist, his body on fire. He had run naked through the fields till he, had, till he was found and taken to a field hospital. He didn't expect to live, but he did. I lived in the small town of Ferozpur and have been to the Husseini Wala border. Many a time I have seen the dramatic retreat parade which starts as a battle of whose leg marches higher. I could feel the tension in the air when the Indian and Pakistani sides screaming for victory of their forces. But what I also noticed was the people sitting on the other side. Families and children all enjoying the drama of the angry soldiers. People so similar to us. After 12 years of living in the army and Puneet hanging up his uniform, I was deeply emotional and wrote a Facebook post. The post was shared and I was invited to write an article by Scrolls editor Naresh Fernandez. What I'm going to do now is read out the article which succinctly puts forward my views on war and patriotism. I am a pacifist, an adjective I picked to describe myself after much deliberation. I chose the word after being part of the war establishment in India, seeing it up close and personal. I became part of the great institution of the army 13 years ago when I married my husband Puneet. As a new army wife who was shown grace, civility, and much chivalry, I enjoyed being a woman within a world where war was celebrated amid the gleam of polished grass, brass and military ribbons. So today it seems a bit dichotomous to call myself a pacifist. It is this dichotomy that pushed me to look hard at war and violence and how it has shaped the world we live in, which is so full of terror, with the media showing us images of whole neighborhoods being bombed in Syria and Yemen, for instance, I wonder at the vast collateral damage of war, which affects people like you and me. My husband has been trained to fight. I have often wondered what I would have done if I was faced with this dilemma of being against war, but wedded to a man forced to fight it. Luckily, I never faced this quandary in the past 13 years. My morality on the issue has never been tested. I must reiterate here that I am anti-war, not anti-military. This is because the military has a role to play, to ensure the security of a country's privileges, resources, and borders. It also assists during humanitarian crisis and is called in to keep the peace when law and order fails. My husband, who retired last month, served the army throughout his career while being guided by the motto of devotion to duty. 
He was not ambitious to rise within the ranks of the army. This was not because of apathy or the lack of intelligence and skill. I suspect it was because he first needed to justify his role in an institution that was always preparing for war. He never found that justification, I believe. Puneet had begun to understand the horror of war from the time he was a young lieutenant when his buddy, a partner assigned to a soldier, both of whom look out for each other, was killed by a United Liberation Front of Assam militant inches away from him. My husband slowly turned into a pacifist military man. It is true that several pacifists are veteran military men who become this way after witnessing the futility of war. I was fast getting influenced by him, as partners often are. The heart-wrenching stories of young civilians going blind because security forces fired pellet guns at them, the times I got to meet war heroes from the 1965 Indo-Pak War, befriended soldiers suffering from war injuries and watched coffins of dead soldiers draped in the tricolor sent back home, have only pushed me into believing that war is a failure no matter who the victor. Fortunately for me, Puneet has not participated in warlike situations that are seen in parts of Jammu and Kashmir and the Northeast. But I have known army wives whose husbands have been deployed there. I have seen their fear and anxiety over a missed phone call. We also hear of terrorist attacks, open combat, shelling at the borders, and other grim scenarios. A very close friend of mine lost her husband in an helicopter crash, and I have witnessed how gravely it has impacted her. A soldier's death often means a cruel and lifelong disruption for their family. Just before Puneet retired, a soldier was driving me and we spoke of war. I did not want to discuss the subject as it is usually an unpleasant conversation to have these days when patriotic emotions are high and taking an anti-war position is often construed as, un as being unpatriotic. But the soldier persisted. He said, who likes war, madam? The soldier I killed will have a family. He too knows the same is true of me. We don't want to fight, but it is our duty. War is a loss for my enemy and me. That is when I realized that since the epic battle at Kurukshetra, as narrated in the Mahabharata, the Dharma Yud, or the righteous war, is still fought in the minds of all army men. At the same time, I am thankful that Puni joined the army. If it weren't for it, we, a Punjabi Hindu boy from Delhi and a Catholic girl from Hyderabad, would never have met. If it weren't for the army, he would not have witnessed the sacrifice of his body. That incident made him realize the value of life as a young officer and was probably one that turned him into a pacifist. Now, I don't know whether he calls himself, I'm, I'm calling him a pacifist because I sort of know his views. If it was not for the army, I would have never understood the impact of war on our lives either. So here I am, a pacifist army wife, for peace is the only way forward. And that's me having fun, you know, grim scenarios, but sometimes you have, being an army wife was lots of fun, interacting with the officers, the boys, so I just didn't want it to be a grim sort of war thing, so just a fun photo that I put up there. I'm not going to, since we need to talk about education for patriotism, I also just put together a slide. And these are, the, slide, the slides contain observations, general observations, as uh, I'm not from general observations about patriotism. So, and how education can actually help Now, what do you think is patriotism? Can anyone, does anyone want to, what does patriotism mean to them? Okay. So, patriotism or national pride is the feeling of love, devotion, and sense of attachment to a homeland and alliance with other citizens who shame, share the same sentiment. Now, I just copied this from Wikipedia. An excess of patriotism in the defense of a nation is called chauvinism. Another related word is jingoism. But, you know, so this is, it, does anyone have another definition of patriotism? But, well, I, 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 mean, I, I suspect uh, while 
one could uh, pretty much define patriotism in an abstract sense. One's experience mm -hmm. of it is a very different matter. And I think what you are trying to do, what we, uh, we should appreciate is, how do we process it subjectively? It's often we go by some abstract notions, including what is a nation state? It's an abstraction, right? Yet. We deal with a lot of abstraction, doing a lot of violence. Part of our problem Absolutely. is abstractions leading to violence, right? So I think while this is generally the consensual definition perhaps of what you showed us, but what is more meaningful phenomenologically, that's more, I use more academic uh, approach, is to see it how people process it. Yes. At the micro level. Yeah. Like uh, in India, like for the common thing, like we all believe, like we all say, like we are patriotic when, sir, when there is some news of the army, like when there is a fight on the border from on the, either on China border or in Pakistan, most, like in most, <coughs> most of the cases when there is a dispute in the Pakistan border. Or when, when there is a cricket match with, between India and Pakistan, then our patriotic feelings are being like we are we are just patriotic. Mm -hmm. We feel like yeah, we are something. So, so like from the beginning, from the like from the very beginning, we are told that this is this is patriotism. That's it. So, is there something else which constitutes patriotism, or this is only the thing? Keep asking that question, I suppose. Yeah. Because there can't be a final answer to any of that. Right? Ask you, yeah, you know, you'll have to describe it for yourself. That feeling, but you start, you've got a good starting point. That feeling. Yeah, I feel patriotic, yeah. When Abhinav Bindra won that gold medal, the national anthem was playing, I felt patriotic. I felt so proud to be an Indian, you know. Yet at the same time, when there's war, I'm like, no, I, no, I don't like what's happening. I, I don't like it. So, like uh, group captain said, you know, you have to, you have to keep defining it for yourself, experiencing, experiencing the word for yourself. It's easy to copy Wikipedia and put it there. Actually, I was debating whether I should put that definition there, but just to get, to get us forward, I have put that, I put that definition up there. Let's say what's religion, right? Asking what's, it's a philosophical person, yeah. but it's abstract. But like the common man, but the common man, common man has a feeling of patriotism when there is a dispute between India and Pakistan and when there is a cricket match. That, the, in that sphere only patriotism lies for the common man. Like, I think maximum of the people of the India lies. The, like the patriotism lies within that sphere. Like when this... Uh, in an this, oppositional stance, what you are hinting at, yeah, it yeah. is expression of a hatred or disgust or a superiority to someone else. Yeah. Okay, uh, this, I, I suspect that runs counter to the notion of patriotism. It's more nationalism, an expression of a textbook definition of nationalism, where other becomes very, I mean, without the other, there is no nationalism. Patriotism can be an expression of love for one's community, one's culture, one's fellow beings, with whom one has shared cultural index. Right? Uh, that, that's why many philosophers find patriotism is a useful, useful conception of human life, useful experience, whereas nationalism is deleterious uh, to human well-being. That's, I think, maybe what you are thinking. Maybe. Can I add, neither I am a, you know, educationist like him, nor I am an army wife. So, you know, you, you talked about India-Pakistan match. Suppose it's an India-Australia match and a finals. But the feeling is same or the feeling is different? Mm -hmm. No. Same, <laughs> different? Thank you. Feeling is same, but the amount of, uh, you know, uh, the excitement of the yeah. city about the winning, it's always, you know, the, we have a match of India Pakistan, it's like a national holiday for us. Mm -hmm. I remember. So, La Liga, Barcelona versus Real Madrid. Mm -hmm. It's like a series like England and Australia. So, it's like, you know, when you have some cultural arguments and fighting with some relatively like you know we have a cultural issue with the india pakistan no like that's that's your conception that's why i gave you another example if there is a la liga match between barcelona and real madrid is it patriotic anti-patriotic it's just my excitement or 
we are calling um, india pakistan match just because we feel it is patriotic or it's a normal match where two teams are playing and we are supporting one team and we are like fans of india and there are fans of pakistan i don't know i am asking this question so do you think fans of la liga are patriotic for la liga for barcelona or, or there is some difference between india and pakistan my my thought it's all created by media i think like you know hype when anything like match happens so this time like you know uh, dhoni and uh, like i remember the sakhalin to stark in jamun lakhak and all sides of ridi so this they will created like this you know from our childhood ki oh, this is india pakistan match boss we need to watch we need to see what happening you know we need to out this guy this that so we created this much so 12 years in a school period you every day in the morning you are going with the national anthem okay we don't realize that we never excited about that but when the commonwealth game or any game any anybody wins gold and the national anthem comes we have a good comes but 12 years continuously school from first to 12 nothing happens nothing excited us but why is it when you know national anthem comes in any commonwealth any game or anything when the national anthem we feel it i never feel it in when the in no narendra modi says you know in the picture all you need to stand i never feel it so the feeling is very important your emotional attachment in the patriotism is very important i think actually sir my question was like the patriotism in india is limited to like the cricket matches and the dispute at the border yeah. so i'm just asking i like, counter question you my question was is the cricket match patriotic or it's just a match or it's just a team thing and we are calling it patriotic yeah we are calling because but is it being patriotic that's my question no, 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 no. it is not patriotic it so, is it is just a simple match but because of the society because of we have learned we have uh, seen like people are dancing after the <laughs> match and people so that's are, precisely i brought it in the you know football analogy between the same you know country two clubs playing there is a huge amount of brawl happening between after matches and english league and premier league whatever so that's that's my question to you was is a cricket match and supporting india is it uh, mm. is it a way of patri- being patriotic i have my you know i have my reservations on that you you may call it patriotic or 90% of the indians may call it you know i am supporting my country so i am patriotic but i don't know like everybody if india if england is playing australia most of the english people will be gunning for their their home team so that's what i ask you as a counter question that so sorry my my two cents are done she is there <laughs> no but so, uh, i think it's useful yeah it is I, i mean i kept this for an open session you know i let's like to interact because uh so it's a dichotomous word also these days it's sort of you know i put up a definition there but sometimes even i sort of grapple with that definition so am i being unpatriotic when i'm stand sitting in ndtv and that girl is saying so you're saying there shouldn't be war to so ravish kumar is asking me believe me i just had to ask to go to that interview ravish kumar is asking me to ye ag log to kahenge ye kamzori hai ki aap uh, war pe nahi jana chahte ho and i wasn't prepared i said bilkul ye kamzori nahi hai ye i mean i was stumped i was like kamzori i didn't expect that question in fact it is i was so scared to even go and say i was like i just written this article for scroll and you know and i forgot about it suddenly one morning i got up it had like so many shares and then suddenly i had ndtv coming and asking me and i i called up my friend i said should i even go there why should so she said you're getting an opportunity to say it to say what you believe in how many are going to do get that and i said okay i'm going and then i wasn't ready for that question kamzori hai kya so i was like am i being a, i mean i had you know i had self doubts because when you're when you're a lone voice you do get self doubt am i really being this am i being you know this am i you have that imposter syndrome sort of like which people suffer from am i the imposter here but so what is your understanding of patriotism love for country could also lead to chauvinism it's true i've seen i've seen it you know india say i have seen it in my own family you know i've seen it india there can be nothing better than india everything is india i mean 
it's like a chauvinistic thing. You're always condemning a Western lifestyle, Western family values. And, you know, I've seen it. Is patriotism indoctrination? Sometimes, yes. Sometimes, and sometimes I see it happening around me. Does patriotism lead to war? You know, I ask myself this question, is this patriotism going to lead to war? I mean, online patriotism that we were having, extreme patriotism that we were having. Does patriotism focus on national unity a pride more than global unity? Are we, you know, is teaching patriotism even necessary? It's a feeling, now nah? it's just, why are we teaching it? Should we teach it? You have grown up, we are singing, every morning I went to school, I sang Vande Matram, I sang Janaganamana, I'm from Hyderabad, so I sang Ma Telugu Telli. You know, I've taken, I've, uh, I said my pledge. How many of you know the pledge? The Indian pledge. Yeah, I said my pledge in school. So, yeah, we were trained to be proud of our country, to have feelings for our country. And, but now I'm going to, so, you know, it's a dichotomous word. It, it, these are some questions that I put up that we need to think about. Sorry, come again? Uh, yeah, I, I got the first part. Why do... Why do people get away with it? Like, if you hit someone or you shoot someone because they said something wrong about, um, about your town or your country, and they... Nationalism, it's a sense of pride for your country, right? So mm -hmm. they can perform that act, but they will not call it nationalism. They will call it patriotism, and people will agree with them. Why do they get away with it? Because we have not been third taught to discern things. We have not been taught to say, you know, this is nationalism, that is not nationalism. Dissent is not being unpatriotic. You know, we have not been taught that in school. You have not been taught that, you know, have you been, has your teacher ever said, you know, this is the problem of Pakistan kids, what do you all think about it? Did your teacher ever tell you that? Or this is the problem, we have Biharis in Delhi and, you know, there is a sort of a, you know, we want, we want to hide things under the carpet. We don't want it out in the open. We want to be politically correct. You know, so, yeah. So, patriotic, patriotism is seen, and nationalism have overlapping, are overlapping meanings also. You must understand that. So, we don't. So, for us, it's all, you say anything about our country, you are wrong. You say anything about uh, uh, the way things are being done, you are wrong. If you say something about the culture and tradition that you might not agree with, you are wrong. Oh, you are, I mean, and if you are perceived, if you are like, for example, I'm often, very often I am, uh, you know, held, people say, oh, just because, too educated hai na, isi liye. I've come, I, I come across and said, you know, people's presumptions, no. Don't you see that I'm trying to make sense to you? Forget my education. I'm, look at me, not for my education. Oh, you're this person. I mean, no. You, have you been taught to discern? Have you been taught to think about what you think is right and wrong? That's a problem. You don't teach that in schools. And when you, uh, you know, when you come out, when you come out into the real world, and how many, how many articles have I seen from youth saying that you know, let us have peace, let us, you know. Let us have, uh, I mean, in the recent, I, I go through some newspapers, I could be wrong, but generally as such, a good article would have made the social media rounds. I've not seen young people even, even saying, suggesting something. Anybody from Jindal has written a paper or uh, said something about the war, whether it's for it or against it, it doesn't matter, but said something, no. Where are you young guys, yeah? So therefore, everyone's getting confused. And therefore, we are also going to talk about it. So did I answer your question? In defense of the young people, all I, uh, I just want to quickly say one sentence. Sometimes silence may be a greater part of wisdom. Sometimes your voice will never be heard, however loud you might shout. So maybe, maybe. more wiser than you and I think. Uh, definitely. <laughs> so just a thought. No, it's definitely, definitely sometimes it is, I mean, your response fuels further responses, and they seem spiraling 
into something that is obnoxious all right. the time. So sometimes withdrawal is a, a descent, a form of descent. Yes, I agree. But uh, no, I'm not suggesting everyone should. You should keep speaking, and we love it. And all I'm saying that there could be no, no, I, a defensive I, stance. No, there, there. Sometimes I have withdrawn, sir. I have taken this stance also. You know, I have been, I have withdrawn myself many it's a, a time. It's a struggle. It's a struggle. Ongoing struggle. You pick your wars. Basically, you can't. You you don't have that much of energy to keep fighting everything. You know, you don't have that much energy to keep saying, okay, this everything can't be an issue with you. You know, life. You have other things to do in life. So even withdrawal is one. But just for example, I was saying more participation could also, you know, would would help us understand better what patriotism and nationalism is. Because right now we understand anything that is not, that is dissent is unpatriotic. Sorry, I just want to add something. In, in Cecilia's defense... Um, no, no, there is nobody attacking her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> peace, peace, peace. peace. Uh, she is speaking out in an environment that is patriotic. Uh, there is too much jingoism. Uh, we have seen more of that now than we have seen in many years in the past sure. in India. And uh, it's a rare voice that is heard. So as much as silence may be a form of dissent, um, it's, it's important, as she said, that there are voices that are heard in this environment. And even one matters, as Ravish Kumar said in that interview. All I was saying, there may be more than one way to respond. Yeah, Absolutely. exactly. You know, I have chosen that uh, group captain. I have chosen that many times in smaller wars that I fight. So now patriotism, my view. Patriotism, be is, patriotism is being actively and positively involved in the relationship between the citizen and the country. Now... You know, I just don't feel patriotic. I'll explain myself here. I, I don't just feel patriotic when Abhinav Bindra, when, the, in the, uh, when my national anthem is being played. In the, yes, I do feel good, you know, when it's playing in the uh, theaters. But I also, you know, I just feel like, you know, when I explain to my, when I explain to my kids that how, how they have not to throw plastic on the road, not to, you know, to keep their clean. Those are acts I'm teaching my children tomorrow. They said, you know, my, my son has a, B, a friend whose mother's from the BJP, and he was like, I'm BJP, Congress down, down. So I, I, I went ahead and explained to him what democracy is, and he shouldn't be saying those sort of things to understand that we are in a democracy. I mean, that's, for me, that is being actively involved. You don't know it, but you are being involved daily. You have to be conscious of it. We think we are not patriotic or we are, you know, and not, uh, we are not only during, no, 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 no. We all are expressing some sort of patriotism or anti-patriotism on a regular basis. You have to be conscious of it. So it's like a relationship. You are conscious of what you're giving the person. You're conscious of what you're taking the person. That only creates a successful relationship, isn't it? So that's with your country also. I want my country to be successful. I want this democracy to flourish. So I explain to people around me. I ask, I, I ask people, see, because mainly I'm, I stay, I'm a stay-at-home mom, so I ask people who come home, who are you voting for? Okay, so they tell me their reasons. I don't influence, I try not to influence any such thing, but I try to gain knowledge what's happening, what's happening outside, what's happening in, in villages. So I try to keep my, update my knowledge about the country, its happenings, what people think. So, also, for me, patriotism is not a fleeting emotion. No, sir, no. It is a set of values I hold very dear for my country. You know, it is, I will not disrespect. I have many things against India, but I will not disrespect it at any cost. It is the understanding the history, culture, and tradition held within the national boundaries. You have to understand what is the history of this nation, why the Northeast is up there, why, why are they so different to us? Why is, why is, why is, why is South India so much more different in, in, in maybe in a thought process or what is the tradition here? The tradition in North India, the, the tradition. So you understand that that also, it's when you are making an attempt to understand, 
Maybe you appreciate it or don't, but you make an attempt to understand that this is how this country is. On a very singular basis, yes, patriotism is also showing respect to the national flag, singing the national anthem and cheering for your country in competition that is held in true sportsmanship. And I was looking for quotes and I found this app for me. Patriotism is supporting your country always and your government only when it deserves it. So I support my country and I'm so proud of it. But sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm an anti-war person. So if my government wants it, I will not support it. I will not, I will request it. Please don't do, look at my opinion. This is what I bring to the table. And... Patriotism is changing. It has changed since 9-11. You are either with us or against us. Now, there are two roads. You know, so are you patriotic or unpatriotic? So is there a middle path patriotism here? You know, the, I'm talking here, patriotism was seen as a collective moral responsibility to one's motherland, especially during India's independence struggle. Remember, we had the moderates who said, yeah, English rule is okay, but as long as they allow us to self-govern. And then you had the extremists who said, no, Purna Swaraj. And then you also had revolutionaries like Bhagat Singh who said, Eind ka patta jawab se do. But all of them lived together. All of them respected each other's philosophy. You know, and they res they might have had their arguments, they might, but they, they were a united front and India got its independence, though many people thought of different ways of getting there. So, you know, and that for me is patriotism. Patriots, patriotism meant love for your country. Country is an abstraction, but believe me, it's an absolute sentiment. And let us not wish away our sentiments. Now, Patriotism is changing. Again, social mass media had made the, has made patriotic feelings you know, very romantic and fleeting. I mean, the one night I'm on TV, the next morning I'm this thing, and then everyone's lambasting me, and then suddenly there's no talk of anything. There's no, I request some people who seem to have good opinions to email me. No, they, they badgered me on there. They badgered me online for, my, and for, my, for what they thought I was being unpatriotic. I said, no, sir, I'm willing to listen to you. Please stop doing it on my wall because I have other friends. Write to me. This is my email address. Write to me. If you want my telephone number, I'll give that also to you. But nobody will take that much of trouble. It's easy. You know, expression, expression without perception is always, it's easy to write that. You know, Facebook gives us that. So patriotism these days has no room for alternative voices. It's now a moral virtue, not an emotion that spearheaded progress. Patriotism has become a divisive factor, not a binding relationship. This, I'm afraid, is what I am seeing, and these are totally my observations. So that brings me, with this context, that brings me to the relationship between patriotism and education. Yeah, any comments? Sorry, I was going ahead. I mean, the glorification of war all the time, yeah. Ek movie banao jaha pe the widow, uh, jaha pe, I think there's going to be, there will be a, there's a movie going to be made on, uh, just this morning I said, on um, uh, Vikram Batra. Captain Vikram Batra, there's going to be, uh, Siddharth Malhotra is playing it. And I was like, glory, it's, it's nice. It's, I mean, but are we so limited now in our stories? Why you, I mean, are we, you know, we have um, the uh, Akshay Kumar's where he's playing Kesar, Kesri, Kesri coming out. You know, it's all sort of everything is India based. So don't we have other stories to, you know, Akshay Kumar suddenly is only, have you seen his movies lately? It's all like socially. I mean, is he too old to do action movies is what I'm thinking. So you now he's like, okay, I'm patriotic and I'm doing this. Anyone has anything to say to enlighten me? Sorry, these are, I live, uh, you know, these are totally my views. And I could, I'm ready to add more to this or to hear, to, hear something new from all of you. you want to, I think 
that sort of the movies are uh, the indian movies the indian horror movies are based on on the positive side of like on just one aspect they are just showcasing one aspect of the indian army they are not mm-hmm. showcasing the real aspect of the indian army what they are actually facing like they have the rifles uh, that were made in 1980s and they were not successful then sars rifle was not su- successful in the even in the kargil war mm-hmm. and in the kargil war if we see that indian army doesn't have the bulletproof jackets they were so heavy they the soldiers cannot go with like cannot uh, climb with the jackets so they without the jackets they went and because of this also there were not lots of casualties happened they don't have night vision goggles so we don't know people don't know that what what the army is facing right now yeah so it's also before you want to ask the last movie war movie was way back you No, no. I mean, forget the war movie. There've been a lot of uh, movies, you know, sort of glorifying yeah. India, Indian. Just showcasing one aspect. Show showcasing the gl- glorifying stories, you know. See, there is something to tell a story. There is something to you know to glorify things. So, I mean, you don't agree. You do you want to? So the aim of the recent spate of movies has been to cater to particular type of audiences and to uh, basically jig up a certain kind of sentiment among the people. I mean, these kinds of movies, right, they show you a certain aspect of war, right? I mean, like the, in the way in which the movie was made through that decision-making process was very centralized. There was one or two people who were charged of making decisions. And the entire credit, I mean, in a very implicit manner was rather given to them rather than other, pe- other people or other... non explicit actors so i mean if you look behind the optics of it you can very well tell that this is a kind of i mean indoctrination also a propaganda movie and that's very clear at the face of it you have to just go behind the optics to see it yeah i mean I movies based on army see, so this based mostly which are released in bollywood and other um, um indian languages uh, some of them i'm not sure uh, i'm not sure a lot of them show the ugly side of war so this A couple of movies which were released by so this is a, there was a guy called Ram Ramesh Sharma who released who made this movie called Kafiro ki Namaz, which wasn't allowed to be released in India. So it, the, uh, the censor board then banned it. He got angry, got moved it. The censor board then released it online on YouTube. We just dumped the entire movie. Yeah, I'm going to see this movie. Okay. It's 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 a uh, not a very pleasant watch. I mean, you have to have a certain kind of uh, toughness about you to actually grasp and digest a movie, and I would say the movie does not give you facts in a very exaggerated sense. I mean, there is a deeper sense of um, loss of morality. Uh, the way it talks about its characters, the doings of the characters, but uh, th- uh, that's an aside. But uh, the point I wanted to make was that the recent part of movies, right? I mean, there's a certain Look at way in which they want to portray uh, ideas to their audiences. yeah you know so leave war let's talk about you know all this uh, look at i'm i'm I, i am a big akshay kumar fan so so i keep looking i'm like what happened to him buddha ho gaya he cannot do any action movie to ye kar raha so you know what are we saying glory forget uh, i mean i'm with you maybe there were no more, more war, war movies and then you had this uh, you know when i saw this movie Dub, uh, dublin no what is the dunkirk how many of you have seen dunkirk yeah. you know now that was a war movie i saw that war movie and i was like no there should be no more war and professor mukar i think you are in a hurry I, and you yeah, need to go somewhere i was somewhere. meaning i just quickly wanted to i'm sorry for you know i haven't seen yuri but um i really appreciate what you're trying to do in in this uh, panel sort of uh, discussion with everybody but i think this is there needs to be and and i think this is an education problem which you have the question that you have raised in your topic itself i think we need to make a distinction clear distinction and i really appreciate the mark twain quote that you highlighted we need to make a clear distinction between nation and nationalism versus country and patriot the very word patriot or patriotism it comes from the greek root uh, care for fellow fellow countrymen yes. 
it's very rooted, very grounded. It's not as abstract, uh, imagined community as Benedict Anderson would say, like the nation or nationalism. Tagore also makes this distinction within mm -hmm. the Indian context. Mm -hmm. Actually, Martha Nussbaum misunderstood Tagore yeah. in a big way, which uh, Ch Charles Taylor, the Canadian philosopher, challenged mm -hmm. her for uh, by writing the, his defense on patriotism. Mm -hmm. Surprise, uh, his, 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 Nussbaum there. Yeah, directly, uh, you know, charging Nussbaum about her misunderstanding of Tagore in defense, uh, Charles Taylor's uh, article in defense of patriotism, and he highlights this uh, difference, drawing from Tagore, which Tagore made in a very distinct way within the colonial Indian context. Tagore was very much a patriot in his own way, all his, including the national anthem, which we, you know, all sing. But at the same time, he raised the huge red, fl red flag against the concept of nation and nationhood. And also, if you look at the uh, indigenous words for, uh, for uh, you know, it's desh and desh bhakti. It's very rooted, grounded in care for fellow human beings. And, uh, you know, yep, absolutely. And even if you talk about global citizenship, you need to first think about local community engagement and care for people in the local community. Because if you can't care absolutely. for the local, then everything uh, goes haywire. Is yeah, it? you have to, an ecosystem is success, you know, an eco, that's why we have an ecosystem, you Absolutely. know, within the spheres of life. Because, I'm getting calls for yeah, bye bye. Now. Thank you so I'm much. I'm so sorry. No, okay. thank you so much. I appreciate uh, what you said. No, um, so you, you finish. No, sir. I, I, uh, go no, ahead. Sir. No, uh, it's, it's, uh, when philosophers start engaging in uh, a debate about, mind. debate about uh, terms such as patriotism, it leads to certain disquiet of sorts. The reason is, I think I was hinting earlier, but let me make that a little bit more explicit. Uh, Tagore, or, or, or Nussbaum, or Charles Taylor, I read Nussbaum's book on India. Um, now, all of them have certain conception of what patriotism, what nationalism, quote unquote, right? Now, trouble is that when we, when we take Tagore's uh, sense of patriotism to the extent he was able to express it uh, in a language, right? Uh -huh. So he's playing a language game. So if suppose you are disposed in some ways to think not so well of Tagore, you could always find holes in his practice of it. Many ways. Mm -hmm. I've studied Tagore at some, some detail. I have a lot of troubles with him. I, I was passionate about him, then I got disenchanted with him. Similarly, I studied Gandhi passionately for nearly 10 years, disenchanted. Nehru, for 20, 30 years, I said I'm Nehru Bhakt of sorts and disenchanted. I have all the books on Nehru, Gandhi that you could possibly uh, find in, so it runs into a few thousands. Uh, and of course, I read a few hundreds of them on Nehru. The point I'm making is it's a language game. The word patriotism is used in certain grammatical sense by each speaker, and same speaker in multiple contexts differently. So let's complicate this. Let's, let's understand that I cannot, from an external standpoint, suggest to you how should you behave if you call yourself a patriot. Even, it's like a family resemblance. The word is often used more like a family. Like say, Wittgenstein would say uh, that in a family, there is no common link between all the members. Someone might share someone else's nose. Someone else might open a child, you know, style of walking or talking, right? Someone else, so, but if you look at them and try to find one common basis as to how to be patriot, you might not find any. So there are multiple expressions of this. But what's important is that we allow those multiple expressions to flourish. To me, that is the bottom line of being patriotic. To me, not some common definition. But to me, I let my fellow, fellow citizens to have their voice, and I respect that. So I, dis I could disagree in some senses of practice, but the fact that they have a voice and they want to give expression is indisputable fact of 
my life. Yeah, like Gote said, right? You have something to. Uh, I may not agree with you, but I will die defending defending you. you. Sorry, oh, you're right to say. So when you say that you cannot tell them what to do, but I think you can curve. Uh, I mean, you can tell them what not to do to a certain degree. You can show them. More important thing is everyone can tell, <laughs> but to show by leaving your spirit of patriotism. I think that is the biggest antidote. Everyone is telling everyone how to be. But very few are leaving their own ideas. That's who, that's what I'm saying. That's where, if you want to really contribute to it, live a life that expresses. It's a struggle. It's not going to be perfect. If you self-declare that I'm going to behave this way and tomorrow you will fail. Right? So, but what I want to see in people is a striving, a struggle to be a certain kind of a person that shows respect for the humanity in others at least in public spaces.